and welcome to episode 272 of Retro Encounter, RPG Fans Weekly Podcast of Many Topics. I'm Alana Hagues and I'm back with the same two panellists as last week to talk about Disc 2 of Button Kaitos, Eternal Wings and the Lost Ocean. So we've all kind of scraped through this to the end. The second half of the game is a bit of a slog and it's it's a long game anyway. We're talking like 50 to 60 hours without doing most stuff, so... Yeah, it's been a bit of a tight one. Some of us are there, some of us aren't, but we've got a good enough understanding to unpack everything and unpacking everything. Same people as last week. We have Pete Leavitt. Hey, welcome to the podcast, folks who are listening. And Tyler Trosper. Hello, children of Earth. <laughs> the children of Earth are great. great. And I, they really are great, just like Great Mizuti. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, like, this too introduces tons of new stuff. Like, it feels very formulaic, Disc 1, and not in a bad way. Like, in a pretty good way, a standard RPG adventure where you're gathering things. And Disc 2 pretty much starts off the same way. Um, as Disc 1 ends, you are going to the Empire, and Melodia is taking you there, because she's the one who can get access to Emperor Gelda Blame and everything. But she goes off and does her own thing, and Callus and the group are kind of left to their own devices to figure out where the Emperor is and what's going on. And this is the first time we've really seen Alphard and the capital Mintaka. Uh, the Empire has been this, like, shady group for a while. They've popped up numerous times, and we've seen, like, the higher subordinates, but it, it kind of drills home that, like, Alphard is corrupt as hell. Like, the buildings are gold-laden, the people have, like, their nose in the air, and they've really kind of stamped their authority everywhere. Like, they they are they are the kings and they won't listen to anybody, but yeah, yeah Alphard they're, is they're a pretty like, hostile They're place. like, almost consider themselves genetic supremacists and they, yes. uh, they're they extremely jingoistic and there's a really disturbing sequence with a small child who's like, why doesn't the whole world just subjugate themselves? Because clearly we're the best. Like, <laughs> Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. That's the kid who you like bump into outside the shop, isn't it? That yep. Gabari's like, "Oh, I'm sorry," and he's like, "Oh, you're just smaller human beings. We are the real like leaders of the world and things like that." And um, yeah, it's genetic supremacy is really, really perfect actually because that Alfard are like, yeah. I mean, I can't actually. Think They're of like the United States, it. is what Alfard is like. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't live in the United States, so I have no, I cannot confirm or deny whether I agree with that, but yeah. Yeah, though there is a <laughs> definite, like, split between, uh, Mintaka and Aza, but I guess we'll get that a little bit. Mm, yeah, definitely. And, like, this is kind of where a lot more character stuff kind of starts creeping up. Um, obviously, Leudes from Alphard and the kind of, you're trying to get through the city and I think there's like an announcement going on so you can't leave. And so Leud's like, okay, let's go back to my house. And we know that Leud was placed in Diadem for a reason and he reveals that the reason he was placed there is because he pulled out of an operation or objected to an operation called Operation Sweep. And we get told this a bit a bit about this more later, but um, Operation Sweep, to summarize it now, is um, uh, it was essentially the Emperor declaring the people of Arthur, which is this mining town just outside of uh, Mentaka, to be killed because they could not keep up with the supply and demand of uh, the Empire. And they were slaughtered. Um, but <laughs> we'll get a little bit more onto that. I think Lude is definitely a good citizen as far as I'm concerned. Lude actually is a character I really like. He's a good boy. I really like him. He is a good boy, but not only that, like he has tons of insecurities which mm. are explored quite a lot here and through his character quest towards the end of the game. Like he's always been he's certainly one of the more quiet ones, but he's had to defend himself for quite a lot of the game. So is Savina because you know, Savina lived in the Empire, and Liud also is an, a soldier for the Imperial Army. Yeah, Liud, mm-hmm. so, Liud is, seems to be constantly a, a, in conflict, where he sees the evils of his homeland, but he loves his homeland. He feels patri- like patriot, patriotic spirit, but um, sees the atrocities and um, and is constantly trying to reconcile that. Um, and he never did, he never renounces. Um, uh, Alfard. He just 
they're just upset that they're it's cool like it's really relatable i think Mm, definitely yeah Uh, no he he's on the right i don't want to say the right side of patriotic because i'm not very patriotic for my own (laughs) country because why would i be no way (laughs) but like he's definitely got the right sense of things he he has an idealized version of his country that he believes can happen yes yeah that's a really good way but he buys into the myth and he's not blind to the bad stuff but he still he won't let go of the myth and not in a way that's like ignorant or in any way negative i don't think i don't think that's the message of of this game but um but in a way where you know he can see he can be optimistic and see a hopeful path forward and and see a way that the empire or you know hopefully no longer an empire but <laughs> that the nation of alfard <laughs> can uh, contribute or something definitely but it's pretty shocking that he kind of sticks to that belief considering what happens literally minutes after you get to his house right yeah (laughs) but at the same time i believe it though you know like i know people like that you know oh yeah, yeah definitely but yeah um obviously he hints towards well he mentions right when you land in mintaka that he has a brother and a sister who are pretty high up in the army so he goes back to his house and you meet his nanny or um called ahmad and then minutes later, his older siblings come in with an army, and Alf, um, Elmira is shot. So not minutes after you get there, she's killed in front of everybody's eyes. Um, and it's quite horrifying. It happens very quickly. And I remember being really shocked when I played this the first time. And it just it just makes me feel even more sorry for Liud. Um, but then... Almad and the siblings are in origin as well. They have a little bit of a story going on there because Liud is 18, so he's not even born yet. But um, a little bit of that family history is explored. And like Liud's family are a fairly well-known high-up family, even in the Empire. So it's good that there's a bit of context there. But I'm not going to go into that because that gets into some spoiler territory for that game. But there's some interesting mm-hmm. stuff. Uh, yeah. But there's a lot of stuff with Alphard in Origins, in fact. Um, your main character is, works for the Imperial Army. Um, so it's, it's completely flipped on its head. Like, he's not a bad guy, but it's a very interesting perspective to have. And especially, like, it reshapes everything. Like, there, there have been people inside Alphard trying to fix Alphard's empire problems for a while. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, after that, you're chased after, um, out of Mintaka because you're trying to find Gelda Elim and you get back on the ship and you find the goldoba and you jump on maybe it's not the worst dungeon in the game but there's definitely an annoying thing about this dungeon yeah so the goldoba (laughs) is like the the empire's flagship right mm -hmm, that's right yeah it's the one that giacomo helms yeah yeah and every enemy do you defeat gives you a code and you don't know what these codes do and then you have to input them on the bridge and oh god okay just... it's, that's annoying i will say if you if you manage to find yourself in a situation where you can play through that part in one sitting um it's easier to keep that stuff straight and obviously if you have like a pad and a pencil oh yeah phone, i i have them yeah. still in my notes right here yeah like <laughs> that's but it's not i don't think that was the right choice i don't they should probably just have dropped keys or something <laughs> Yes. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the PlayStation 2 era likes to do things like that. I mean, passwords have been a thing for a while, but yeah, it's still annoying. But like, the the main bugbear with this dungeon is the obvious thing. And like, if you Google anything about Barton Kytos, like difficulty spikes, this is the difficulty spike you'll get. <sighs> and I, I glossed over this last episode, but I glossed over the save mechanic. And this is where it's really important. So there are two types of save points in this game. There's a blue flower, which you can save at, but you can also go to a church, which is off somewhere in the high sky. And you can, you hand in Constellation Magnus, which is like a side quest where you collect all the 52 parts of the constellation. Um, There is, and then there's a person who you can use to spend your experience points to level up, but you can only level up when you've got enough to go up, if that makes sense. So like you can't like incrementally spend it. Like if you've got like 200 off of a level, you can't just spend 200 of the 2000 experience you've got and save up the rest. Right. Uh, you can also class up there as well. But the other type of safe flower and the blue safe flowers tend to be in like safe areas. And sometimes at the beginning of a dungeon, 
But red safe flowers are always in dungeons. And when you get on the Goldoba, you're stuck on the Goldoba. And there is no blue safe flower. So if you come to the boss underleveled or underprepared and you didn't make a double save file, you could be stuck here for a while. And oh my god. I, I'm okay with this boss now. To make it clear, it's um so you've fought Giacomo and Falon a couple of like once or twice each before. But now you've got both of them and Amy, who you've met before. And you you have technically fought before as well, I suppose, in the Iron Beetle. Yeah, yeah, you fight just her. Yeah, and uh, this fight's awful. (laughs) It's so (laughs) awful. Oh my god, I hated it so much. It's really tough. They they hit so hard, hard. and you gotta, I mean, the strategy I find, I I managed to get through this one. I I wasn't this lucky with all the bosses. I had to restart only a couple times, and I was able to get it, but you just gotta focus your attention on one. And just get the firepower yeah. off the board, mm-hmm. <laughs> basically. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. You either I usually take out Fallon first because of power up, energy Same. drink, or whatever he uses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I've gotten really lucky in this fight before and like killed one of them in one or two turns, oh, which whoa. is all. Oh. Yeah, um, this was wow. this was when I really clicked with the like numbers mechanic, and so I got like a one to six sweep with probably Callus, and then a one to five sweep with Mizuti on Falon, and he went, and I was like, "So you oh, were able well, to deal? I think I'm going to do like, this in one or two turns, like six thousand damage or something. At this something point? like it was like right. three or four thousand. Yeah, because I think their HP counts. Like, yeah, it, it, it's a pro- I didn't do it this time. I struggled this time, um, even though I'm way better at managing the deck. But yeah, like the idea is generally take out Falon and then Amy and then Giacomo. But like. The, these two in particular, like the bosses up until this point, they've not been not, you know, they've not been easy, but I think you've been able to get by. And I think this two is like a significant step up because most of the bosses or a good handful of the bosses in this two are really hard. Like the next boss in the game is Gelderblame and he's got an instant death spell, a draining spell and a poison spell. And it's like, okay. And then there's another boss that's got like, a stun spell and like a drain spell and a death spell and it's ridiculous. Right around that I'm time, like, like after Geldoblame, is when I really had to focus on like okay, uh, elemental stuff. Like because I never paid attention, I was just like, what's the attack power? And I would just scrape through really suboptimally, mm. I'm sure. But the, in this too, you're forced to be like, oh man, I got to use light attacks and then yes. fire attacks and like, yeah, just managing your deck that way, and it gets really. <laughs> sometimes frustrating but it ends up being cool once you just get the hang of it sometimes yeah it's, sa- mm-hmm. it's satisfying yes. i think yeah i yeah, i agree yeah I, 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 like for the first time past- i was like opening up my deck and switching out magnus to make sure that my attack deck was, had all the right stuff to it and and it got a little troublesome to like if i was switching characters okay i got to unequip all the magnets from the one that i want to put on the new one that i'm bringing in to make sure i have like all my healing stuff as well um if if someone has all the revive cards i gotta make sure i get them off of them and put them on the person i'm now taking with me so there's some management involved but it was it's it is kind of fun yeah i really like it and i think the mechanics are kind of I like, like I really love this game in certain ways, and I think the mechanics are what keep me going. Like I'm fully invested in like playing around with these decks and playing around with these characters, despite where the story might let me down numerous times in this part and maybe every a lot of other things. But yeah, um, so we find out that Gelder blames in the lava caves. Giacomo tells us this, and he tells us a bunch of things as well. There's like a load of plot dumps, and this is where like Callus becomes more like important to the story because. I mean, first of all, Callus, we could have just left the Goldoba without a fight, but you're the one who wanted to start the fight with Giacomo, mm. so you're the reason we had to fight this boss. Callus just pisses Thanks. me off so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, He's he does. Gotta have too. his revenge. He's like, got to, oh, wow. um, and he gets it, kinda. Mm. Um, but yeah, yeah. That, uh, so that's when we learned oh, that uh, Giacomo is Georg's son. Yeah, that's right. So if you're really observant, in um, in Taka, one of the NPCs tells you about a famous scientist who built a winglet and the Goldoba. And then Georg, um, Giacomo reveals that Georg 
built the Gold- Goldoba, who is also his father. And then Kalos um, refers to Georg as his granddad, and so Kalos assumes, like, <laughs> you know, it's a real Darth Vader, Luke Skywalker moment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it embarrassingly took me a few playthroughs to realize that Kalos was not Giacomo's son. <laughs> just oh i thought we were we'll i thought we were that. gonna get there later but okay <laughs> let the cat yeah. out of the bag alana go right ahead yeah <laughs> hey like if you're listening to this episode and you've not beaten <laughs> button kyle's what are you're you doing getting, yeah, like, you're, you're cool with the spoilers or you're playing the game i get it all right <laughs> yes anyway so callus so, is uh the quote-unquote grandson of georg but it, but i guess now we know not necessarily the son of uh giacomo so keep that in mind mm-hmm. keep that one in mind uh so yeah giacomo blows the ship up and you presume they're dead which is great which means callus's revenge is all over i guess but no apparently not um so now he can next focus on, as- on the on the dissatisfaction and emptiness that comes inevitably after one fulfills their revenge <laughs> Oh, he fulfills. He gets some fulfillment very soon. Um, but yeah, we were now in Azha to go to the lava caves, which is where Gelderblame's gone because that's where the last End Magnus is sealed. Giacomo also reveals that Gelderblame has all of the End Magnus. So the one that we lost in Mira, the ones that we, you know, the ones that Giacomo have actually taken out of our hands. And I think Giacomo also took the pendant off of Shella as well back in Mira. So mm-hmm. we don't even have a way to unseal it. So we're in Azha. We find out more about Operation Sweep. But more importantly, we also find out that not only was Savina a member of the Empire, she was the one who led Operation Sweep. And I think this is probably the most harrowing part of the game, especially her backstory. Like, the flashbacks that you get in Azha, because Azha is like a desert town, but really, think like the really empty, like desolate desert town where even the inside of the shops and is really desolate and like really broken like there's girders hanging down and things and people there's, like, live like dust. communally in these like dirt towers mm. they're, they're almost like adobe houses like earthen earthen houses but they're big towers and they just live on top of each other and they don't have enough of anything and there's like you know it's just completely horrible it's everyone's in just abject poverty yeah yeah, yeah it's yeah. A, a huge contrast to mintaka definitely yeah like when when you leave the dirt tower for the first time and the little kid runs up to savina and is like get out of our village you murderer like even with the like nasally voice acting like that bit with the flashback where she's like killing people and the portrait of her face like is she shocked as she's doing it it's like it's awful yeah. so operation sweep is is a is a genocidal operation carried out by the empire because the the workers were protesting in Aza and that was seen as rebellion and revolt. And so they punished them through basically warfare through, through, through genocide. And, uh, yeah, they, they gave the orders to the military of which, you know, Savina was a part <laughs> and she followed the mm-hmm. orders and yeah, it's, it's really awful. Mm. Yeah, I mean, one of the other characters, um, Asdar, he does turn up later on, and he's like the leader, or he was a member of the Mad Wolf unit, which is the unit that took part in the operation, and it's really interesting. It comes up in her character quest in particular, so yeah, we'll definitely revisit it. But going through the lava caves, um, there is a little laboratory at the back, and you have to do this silly powder snow puzzle where you have to, you have to go back and forth through the lava oh caves God. like four times. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they, they, yeah, they, like, they love to badge crack in this game and this is like you go you got to get the cave ice and then you got to go back to the lab put it in make the snow and then go back to put the snow on the lava to make it so you can cross the lava yeah, yeah i right. mean at least like all the other dun- at least all the other dungeons look really pretty or really interesting like the library is really cool and you know, I'll walk through Broken Mirror Dungeon 40 yeah, times. Totally. That's fine. I don't mind that. But, like, this is just a cave of lava. And there's only, like, what, three screens, maybe? It's not a long dungeon, no. but it feels a lot longer. Well, the en- some of the enemies are in- are unavoidable. And some of those mm. just battles with just the regular enemies take a long time. If you're like me, and you play suboptimally. <laughs> 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 No, it's just annoying. Don't worry, you're not playing suboptimally at all. Um, But yeah, the lava caves themselves are fairly uninteresting, but what happens in the lava caves 
kind of flips the entire game on its head. Um, so we beat Gelder Blame. That's great. That's fine. Well, Gelder Blame actually uses all five of the End Magnus to unseal or split the dimension and reveal this castle called Core Hydra. And he thinks he's reviving Malpertio by doing this. Uh, he absorbs the power of the five End Magnus, turns into whatever he turns into, uh-huh. and you fight him. Mm, yeah, let's not go look into that. Um, and, yeah, look, just just a quick Google. If you're listening to this and you don't remember, look up Gelder Blame as a boss. It's pretty grotesque. Um, and then you beat him. It's a fairly tough fight. And then Melodia appears. And sweet, sweet Melodia from the sweet, sweet town of sweets. <laughs> yeah, and this is where everything clicked for me as a kid because she comes out in the like the way she speaks, and you're like, even though this is not the first time we've met her, like you suddenly realize, I think in this moment that she is the one who's been reading the gate to R has been open, or the gate the gate to the chair has been opened, like all of those bits that happen after you get the Magnus. Yeah, actually, she's the one who's been reading it. Right, actually, since this is like the first time I've like played it through with voice acting. Um, I just, I just now realized that what oh was her goodness. speaking. So I was like, oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't oh. realize that. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. I'd never even considered that. Yeah. Cause obviously like, yeah, the, we covered that. The voice acting's not great. So people would have turned it off, but yeah. Oh my goodness. God, that would, yeah. So then I guess you'd have just assumed it was some gen, generic narr- narrator. Yeah, well, yeah, it was just like some cryptic voice, like, okay, Sorry. I don't know where this is coming from. Jeez, yeah. But yeah, like, I felt really stupid for not knowing it because it is really obvious because she has got such a distinctive voice, like, even mm-hmm. amongst the rest of the cast. But mm-hmm. yeah, um, Melodia being evil. <sighs> I love the twist. So the twist is like, you know, Melody's been working with Fadro, who is like Gelder Blame's right hand man, and he dies. Well, Gelder Blame dies, and then they use the End Magnus, and Melodia calls to the rest of your party. She's like, oh, you can come out and step out now. And Callus reveals that he has been working for Melodia the entire time. And the reason he's been doing it is because he just wants more power, <laughs> which, okay, <laughs> fine. Um, <laughs> love it fine but like more specifically and i don't think i noticed this the first two times i played it but this time in particular he says that he wanted more power to avenge his parent like his grandfather and fee but at this point you've already done that so why do you still need the power but it's a cool twist anyway he gets another wing (laughs) <laughs> so he gets like two big wings and this like recalls something that one of the um fortune tellers tells you or i think it's the storyteller in mirror they say beware the white winged darkness or something like that and callus has become that white winged darkness um so yeah callus is betrayed your party and shella interestingly seems to have figured it out at some point mm-hmm. she like tries to stop him and is like no i don't want people to know this why are you doing this before anybody's revealed anything and at first i just thought it was a fake out that the game was doing to like suggest that she was the traitor but no she she's known the whole time and like later on in the game yes. like she indicates yeah, it. she always really seems to be five steps ahead mm. yeah and it, it, it really is effective in that first little bit it's it's cool that like callus the little avatar you're running around on screen ends up betraying everybody and yeah. yeah it's just like not at all i mean you typically don't you you expect betrayal you expect some twist uh, but even though technically you're not callous like you, it does just feel that way just from years of playing games and if you're mm-hmm. playing this game you probably have and that's kind of the idea that you have and then it's like oh this character <laughs> is bad it's cool i yeah, love it i mean i freaked out in yeah. the chat with you guys when it happened <laughs> you oh, did yes. yeah i was like trying to figure out what twist it was i was like i'm sure it's this one i'm like yeah it's definitely that one but yeah no like you say like you are not technically playing as callus you are the spirit and mm-hmm. as callus says like him and melodia used a memory wipe spell on the spirit and that essentially flips like the like unreliable it kind of flips the unreliable narrator's thing on its head but at the same time i guess callus is still kind of the narrator you're just like the observer but you're actually like it's like a fourth wall breaking thing. Like not only the person outside the game watching, but you're also like the spirit on the outside of the world watching as well. Yeah, so almost like suddenly you can't it's... even trust what you've seen. 
and what you've experienced yeah, necessarily. Exa- yeah. Yeah. So yeah, uh, you're all arrested and Callus is now the bad guy. So. Which good, because yeah. that kid's I- kind of an asshole, so. <laughs> yeah he definitely is but like again like i love betrayals in rpgs like i live for these kind of dramatic moments that are ridiculous and nobody would ever do it in real life but the main character being the traitor is a big thing yeah like i, would... I can't think of another game that's done it someone's gonna correct me though i think <laughs> i'm sure they're out there but it's but it's neat nonetheless Oh yeah, mm, I was it's way more uncommon. Definitely blown away by it when I first played this. Mm, like I played some Tales games before, which are like infamous for betrayals, but like never, it's never the main character. It was like, oh, you know, the fifth or sixth character. Yeah, I and Ka- I Ka- did... Ka- is very clearly. Uh, go ahead, Tyler. I'm sorry. Oh no, you can go on. I was just kind of gonna diverge a little bit. So you go, you go first. I'll, I'll just be brief. Um, I, I, Callus is very clearly supposed to be. Like the 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 character the audience is supposed to relate to they you know like they tend to do they assume that a teenage boy will play the game so you make the teenage boy the protagonist so that's why in tales games when you're the teenage boy you can never have that guy betray you because that's who mm. the player is and so that that kind of makes this a little bit cooler than your typical betrayal yeah. that you see. Yeah, I would You're agree. supposed to see yourself in say? him. Hmm. Mm, yeah, even if he is bratty and whiny, but like he's to- he's totally different in terms of protagonist style mm-hmm. and the way they take him as well is yeah, just really interesting. Um, Tyler, what were you going to say? Um, have either of you played Star Wars: uh, Knights of the Old Republic? Oh yeah, I have not, but now you say it, I do remember. I do recall. A big twist. So, yeah, I, I think I like talking this. about. I think yeah. I played this around the same time, or I can I remember comparing them in my mind. But there was a s- kind of similar twist, so that that did remind me of this, and I I'll probably go into it later. But the, I, there was some differences that were interesting in comparison. Yeah. God, yeah, no, that's a really good comparison, actually. Um, yeah, no, I've not played it, but I'm, I know what you're referring to because yeah, I likewise. think it's quite famous. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, Shell is imprisoned in the Imperial Fortress, and you escape with her, and not before that, uh, your spirit becomes you bond with her. So Shella is now your main character, and this is kind of a weird middle section of the game, and. It kind of, like, again, like RPGs of the time, I kind of expected this to be the end section of the game. Like, you'd go on, you'd probably beat Callus, and you'd save the world kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, so Shella escapes the fortress, and she meets up with three witches, or three older, strange-looking, varied-looking characters. Like, the witches' designs has always, always kind of intrigued me. Like, you've got, like, a bird lady, a strange... I mean, I don't really know how to describe her. She, she's no, just very... No, I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing at the bird lady. I'm not laughing at her. She's great, but... Oh, yeah, they're so cool designs. Well, like, d- you describe the other done, two. Like... I interrupted you. I apologize. <laughs> I'm No, don't worry. I mean, I'm don't... the other two are a lot more normal now that I think about it, but they're just... Their, their designs are definitely unusual. Like, even in the world of Baton Kytos, where you've been to, like, Picture Book Village, like... These three witches are very un- interesting. Uh, but you now get some transportation in the form of a dragon, and you go back to Anue Nue, find out that all of your other friends have been taken to other locations, and you have to go and rescue them. And there's no real plot relevance to it. You just kind of go around. You can do them in any order, which is good. Um, but you basically have to take a Magnus to the gate and unseal it with that Magnus. So I think it's, what is it? It's cloud for diadem. Um, is it one of the flower seeds for the celestial tree? Oh, oh God. Or no, oh, it's the seeds. Yeah, it's the seeds. From it was the seed. Cause, oh, man, I hated that because I went all the way at the top and it was like, you need the seed. Yeah. It's like, oh, wait, the only place you can get the seed is in Cor- Queen Corellia's room, which is all the way uh-huh. back in Komumai, and it's like I did the same thing. <sighs> yeah, me too. Every time, every time, because all the other ones are really nearby. Like the clouds are just in the cloud passage. You just go in, dart out, and go to the um, the wind cave area at the top of um, oh god, Sheliak, and then the, the, the lava, other, the lava cave caves is lava. Is lava. Yeah. Which is everywhere, and Mira is—I don't remember what Mira is. It's either a press. It's the, or no, something. it's the it's the mirage weed. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. It is the weed from the garden, which, again, is really easy to get. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. So, yeah, you free all of your friends. And then they're like, where do we go? And oh, surprise, there's a new kingdom. There's an entire new area we've never been to before. Like, it's been on the map the whole time. Um, but the ice kingdom called Wazen and, is there. And, and guess who the queen is of Wazen? It- oh, yeah. We find that out at the kingdom, definitely. Because um, Mizuti is the one who suggests going there because she's like... They want to find out how to save Callus and save the world, basically. And Mizuti's like, oh, I remember the rumours of an ice kingdom called Wazen, and they might have a solution. And Shella kind of pushes for them reluctantly. She's like thinking about it. And then she's like, yeah, let's go. And we go to Wazen. Snow area is annoying because it's slow. Um, okay, okay. And... But but it's kind of cool because... <laughs> Yeah, when, it's you, cool. when you walk through the snow, the snow gives way and you make little trails. And like, it's so that's cool. great, man. This is a GameCube game and they're doing snow physics. I I love I it. Yeah, well, the water and the snow look really good as well, like in all the different areas. And actually, um, the ice town, um, I'm not going to call it by its... Actually, Cursor is the name of the town. Mm-hmm. I am not saying the name the of castle. the castle. Oh, God. Yeah. I don't know. It's... No. <laughs> No, I can do Neil Arthur Tep a million times, but I'm not doing the castle. No way. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, yeah, no, it is kind of cool. Uh, it's just slow. It's not as bad as another dungeon later on. So yeah, um, so the wind but... blows and it constantly shifts direction. And if you go against the wind, you're just way slower. So you trudge through, but then the wind might shift and then you're maybe with the wind at your back and then you run normally. So mm-hmm. it's annoying. Yeah. It's definitely I... annoying. And I always find that like, and I found this especially towards the end of the game, like Fire Magnus, I didn't have tons of it, even with Savina, like split amongst the rest of the party. Shella and Mizuti had some, but I definitely had a lot more water magic. And then Callus has only got a few swords. Obviously, you don't have Callus at this point, And then Liud hasn't got any. So it's like, oh, well, the main strength that I have against these enemies is the card I probably have the least of next to Kronos or Dark, maybe. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um but yeah, you unseal the uh cursor and you go to the Ice Kingdom, which by the way, like we've talked about how pretty this game is. Is this or a new and new the prettiest place? Like this town is gorgeous. Mm. I love it so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's hard to say which I prefer, but definitely like you will go into the houses and like the floor is is um has what do you call it? That inlaid carving in the ice floor <laughs> everything yeah. is just so intricate it's really something it's amazing yeah um i feel like yeah this place is just incredible to look at but like yeah you go to the castle and we are after or what well, we go and talk to shella's again nanny or something um i can't remember her name is it cadell the like nanny or something it's or something barnett which is barnett thank you i'm getting all my names mixed up today and uh yeah, you find out that Shella is the Ice Queen because she's like, welcome back, my queen. And everyone's like, oh, my God. Yeah. Like, this 17-year-old is the queen of that yeah, a fun moment. Magic Land. Gives her more yeah. more Melia points. Does give her more Melia points, indeed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Princesses and queens and everything. Um, but, yeah, so Shella um, has to undergo a ritual to get something called the Ocean Mirror, which will reflect back Callus's will reflect Callus's bad stuff out of him essentially is how I interpret it like the ocean mirror is one of these three magical artifacts um one of them being the pendant that Shella has which is now broken I believe and um another one which we'll go into in a bit is the sword of the heavens these three artifacts Uh, are supposed to be what sealed Mount Persio away in the first place Yes, that's right. And so you, okay, (laughs) before we skip ahead to the, like, getting the mirror, which you get, this boss, the Ice Queen, or the old Ice Queen, I can't remember what it's called. It's like Shella's trial or something. It's like a challenge just for Shella. What did you guys think about this? I thought it was, like, kind of no big deal. I think I got lucky. Yeah, this is the problem. Like, so... It plays, there's only one other fight in the game that plays like this, and it's Mizuti's character quest at the bottom of Zosma Tower. Um, so instead of being a standard battle, it's just Shella, and you get a line of cards, all deck, deck down, all face down. And the enemy pulls one card, and you basically have to play a game of snap. So you have to find the matching card that goes with it. And so there's six elemental cards, a chance card, which lets you pick between, gives you a 50 50 chance rather than like a, I don't know, 10. 
10% chance. And then there's a camera magnus. And yeah, these, these are rubbish. Mm -hmm. They're just luck, aren't they? Like there's no skill involved in them at all. And like, you can either get really, and every time you pick the wrong card, you take damage and you can't heal like at all. So it's like, you've either got to get really lucky or just keep doing it. And I mean, just little enough damage to where if you take enough damage for it to be a problem, that means you've been playing this thing for like five or or eight minutes or whatever. So you're just watching Mm -hmm. your health kind of slowly tick down. (laughs) And you're like, she gets over wrong. I mean, after all the other hard and difficult boss battles in the game, I was okay. I was okay with it. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a change of pace, and it's not, you know, after having Gelderblame and the trio back to back, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, finally, you know, I don't have to put the effort in, <laughs> I suppose. It's like, I can fucking put my feet up and just, like, yeah, just save beforehand, definitely. Um, but yeah, so you get that ocean mirror, and then you have to infiltrate the Imperial Fortress, which is the longest dungeon in the world, and the easiest dungeon in the world to get lost in, I think, like... Every time. I hate elevator dungeons as well. Oh, yes. I hate PS2 dungeons. This era, like, <laughs> Pete and I were saying this, I think, in the chat a few, like, days ago. There's something, like, people love puzzle dungeons and they want them back. But then I go back <laughs> and play this and, like, Sh- and Shadowheart's Covenant as well. Like, I'm thinking of the Nemeton Tower, which isn't the worst thing mm. in the world, but there's something about this era of dungeons that you know, is just not great. And, like, Barton Kytos has been really good up until this point. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't think, like, the Imperial Fortress is terrible, but it's too long. Like, it feels like a final dungeon. And I think that's the the idea, I guess. It definitely inspired in me the looking up of a guide. So, but (laughs) if I didn't know, like, oh, gather up water now. That would have, I mean, water is kind of everywhere. You can go into like the toilet and get the water, the stagnant water (laughs) cards that you need or whatever. But if I didn't know that, I would have been like lost, you know. Yeah. Not the best. Yeah. Not the best thing. But hey, follow a guide. It's not that bad. Yeah, and there's some really cool bits as well. Like, you see Gelder Blame's throne room, and there's some cards hidden behind there. And isn't there a room that Melodia also used to stay in, which is all very kind of cutesy and pink well, and girly. Well, Gel- Gelda Blame's room, I think, is cutesy and pink and girly. That's right! Yes! Yeah. Yeah. So, what was going on there? I have no it's idea. It's like, I you, you, you go over... I mean, there's some stuff in there that is potentially disturbing. Like, you can go over and, and you can observe... Um, two sets of clothes one of them big and one of them small uh not mm. okay i sorry I, I i say that i'm hearing what i'm saying i don't think it goes quite into like that completely awful territory um i just heard myself say that and i should make that disclaimer but it's just like okay yeah, you mean like you mean like petite don't you like yeah a, like a small a, adult a, a man and a woman's a, a man and a woman's clothing basically but like gelder blame is definitely older in years and definitely the embodiment of and they're just on the floor and his bed is this big enormous like circular opulent thing and yeah there's dolls and and there's a rocking horse it's really oh god yeah you get the you get the doll magnus from there (laughs) yeah like one of those like really creepy toys and it's like yeah it really made the game does a good job of making you hate like the empire and gelder blame in particular like gelder blame's got no redeeming features at all he's a schemer and a just a grotesque human being the way that he treats like the people of Arthur and the people who work for him and everybody essentially like everybody so everybody lives to serve gelder blame so yeah, yeah but you're, I'm, you're I'm walking through he... this really like like bronze and copper piped really industrial looking area and then you go into his room and it's just like flowers and sunshine and a rocking horse Mm. and eh, yeah it's something it's weird yeah um but yeah more fun bosses in this place (laughs) because we haven't had enough so not only you know this is fadro yeah (laughs) be on your best behavior Uh um and (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but yeah, Fadro as well has taken on the power of Malpertio and turns into... I mean, he looks a bit more normal until he does certain things, but this boss is another one that has instant death spells and status effects and also, like, really unusual weaknesses and things. And I'm just... Yeah, like, after... I feel like this dungeon took me, like, two hours, two and a half hours. This, because this boss so can deal out, like, a thousand damage and they... Uh, can they attack twice in a row? Um, or is that not till the next occasion- 
I, I think, think that's does. the next boss. Well, regardless, this or boss what? hits hard. Ooh. Yeah, he, yeah, because yes. you've probably only oh got, what, two thousand, two and a half thousand health at this point? So, like, a thousand damage is, like, a thousand to fifteen hundred damage is, like, over half of your health at this point. Especially if you're using, like, Shella and Liud, who are, like, paper bags and take so much more damage and can't defend from most attacks or some attacks because they don't have defensive don't have a defensive weapon right yeah they, I they yeah and it's 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 hard really hard for them in particular to defend against a laser beam coming from the ball eyeball eyeball yeah the eyeball, eyeball. yeah nice nice save <laughs> just just use your imagination to think of where the eyeball is everybody you know <laughs> where are eyeballs L- come on g- i mean look- alana alana grow up okay I know. Uh, I'm sorry. We were just gel- googling Gelder Blame earlier. I can't help it. Like, yeah, G- Button Kytos has fun with enemy design. Let's put it that way. Like, if you are born of Malpertio's evil, you're gonna look funky. Put it that way. So, how much of that is Gelder Blame's Cal- influence? Maybe. Like, you think Gelder Blame's brain share went up into the creation of these monstrosities? I wonder. I mean, oh. actually, now that you say it, like. I suppose if they're taking on, like, the evil of a god, are they manifesting into their, like, worst kind of... Oh, what do you say? Like, their worst sins or something like, their like that. Like, worst imaginations or... Yeah, or oh. well, their worst imaginations, but also, like, becoming what they represent. So, like, Gelder Blame is, like, a lustful, gluttonous human being, and he turns into, like, tentacle, huge thing with uh, protruding parts of the body. Um... <laughs> Like, so, you know, I guess they're just becoming, like, grotesque. Kind of like how the homunculus in Full Metal Alchemist are, like... Like, they embody their, like, seven deadly sins. Like, right. If that... That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at them. Oh. Um, but that's possible. I, could, the thing is, we know almost nothing about Fadro, so we yeah. can't really yeah. say what exactly. his thing is. Uh, and also, like, Fadro's um, design is also reused for another boss and some enemies in the final dungeon. So, yeah just having a bit of fun really but yeah i think it would be interesting if it was something like that but yeah hmm. um next boss is uh the angel of darkness which is callous oh and... wait wait it's callous everybody <sighs> oh my oh, god wait, well, he yeah turned. i we know, know i love already. hold on sorry <laughs> <laughs> i don't know why i'm so careful about no that. you weren't um, yeah, i just you, have... <laughs> you were not you did the right thing i was the one who forgot that we already said that <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah um but yeah, um, this is, I kind of pick this up as a, like a bit of a difficulty spike. It's not as hard as Fadro, but it's definitely a war of attrition kind of thing. Yeah. Like you just have to kind of chip away and hope for the best. And you'll probably go through a couple of card deck reshuffles in this fight, which I think I'd only had once before this point, like probably in the trio fight. Can so, I just you know. mention, so narratively, they make a big deal about the, the ocean mirror being the key to bring yes. Callus back. But that's also a card in your deck. Um, yeah, pro tip: so, do not use that card on Callus in the fight. Yeah, despite I mean, what you hear, don't do it because you will heal him a thousand damage and give him resistance to everything, <laughs> which is what yep, you're supposed to do that. to yourself, not to him. Yeah, yeah. Actually, for a while, it took me going back to healing. Like, it took me a really long time the first time I played this game to figure out how to heal myself. Like, you don't have to press it's the shoulder obvious. buttons to use... Yeah, I no, it's not definitely healed an enemy the first time I tried to heal myself. Mm, at least it wasn't callous on this occasion. No. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this fight's just really long, and obviously, like, if you're like me, when I'm playing this for the first time, you think, oh, this is the end of the game, and you save callous, and it's, it's not the end of the game, because Melodia runs away with... This is the first time we've seen Malpertia as well, isn't it? Yeah. Like, in this room... Yeah, what what do we think of that? Like, mm, he's a... cool. He's gross. I like him. Yeah, I can definitely he... see like the different parts of him definitely look like different parts of like different gods to me. Right. Yeah. And like, actually, that's a good point because like up until the lava case, we'd been led to expect that like this was five part the five parts of Malpertio, but at the lava case, Melodia reveals that it's just five parts of five different gods. So yeah, the, it, it definitely looks like something. It's like it's like a Frankenstein's dolls kind of mm. god, and it is disgusting. Like it, it, it definitely inspires some kind of fear in you because like everything else, all the other enemies up until this point are pretty and cute, apart from like the weird girl, like the weird 
monsters that come out of um Malpertia or Core Hydra or whatever. But yeah, like this is your typical RPG fake out end of game. So you save Callus and the game carries on like nothing happened. Yeah, it's like, like yeah, you save Callus <laughs> first of all, missed opportunity. Like yeah, th- that could have been the tragedy of the game. Other JRPGs have done this kind of thing where you, there's no there's no bringing people back who you lose and things like that, but not here. Yeah, uh, they that's go for a more conventional yeah. approach. Yeah, kind of going back to how I mentioned uh, uh, Knights of the Old Republic earlier, um, the, something in that game happened very similarly, and there was definitely more f- like fallout to it. Like there was some characters mm-hmm. that weren't okay with what happened. So I thought, in comparison, that Kotor kind of did a little better job than this game did because. People kind of just got over it really quickly in this. They're just like, we're glad to have you back, buddy. And he's like, yeah. I'm yeah. so sorry, everybody. It's okay, Callus. Yeah. Come here, man. Bring it in. Yeah, you've only been, you've only been lying to like set like hundreds of people for what months, haven't you? Like, and you have it. no manners. <laughs> nope, no manners at all. But yeah, like, is this like a Japanese RPG problem? Because like, I'm thinking in my head, and I'm like. I'm bringing up all, like, the Tales games in my head that I've played, and, like, the immediacy of the, like, forgiving the character for betraying you, like, is ridiculous. Like, some of the characters in the Tales games do some awful things, like, the one in Vesperia in particular, Uh, I'm not going to name them in case, yeah, mm. in case everybody hasn't played it, but, like, yeah, like, he betrays you in a major way, and yes, he does redeem himself to a degree by saving your life and dying, but then he comes back and everyone just hits him in the face and is like, oh, you can join back again. And it's like, no, come on. Like, consequence, it makes like it makes it feel like not worth it. And I think it does it here as well. Like, I think, like you were saying, Pete, like it would have been interesting if he'd... I, I don't mind him being saved necessarily, but what I do mind is them forgiving him so quickly. Mm-hmm. Like, you wanted all you wanted was power. You'd already achieved what you wanted to achieve in, like, avenging your grandfather and Fee. And then you still become this angel of darkness and the white-winged darkness that's going to bring terror on the world. And you just want us to, like, forgive you. <laughs> it's like... It's a oh, missed opportunity. Exa- it's a shame. A massive. But without it, we wouldn't go to see the children of the earth, would we? Yeah. So I guess everything's forgiven, I mean, right? <laughs> pretty much, to be I mean, honest. Part of me wonders if part of his goal was to get, like, the other wing or have two full complete wings because since he was ostrich ostracized as a kid for having just one but probably i really yeah. think that he that that was a, a way that they manipulated him mm-hmm. potentially mm. that was my yeah initial definitely thought, anyway. it, yeah it comes up a little bit later on does it the celestial alps um but actually interestingly um before Callus wakes up from being knocked out like he has a flashback of, and this is the first time we see fee and i think I said at the end of the last episode that we had a flashback in the uh, in the Shrine of Spirits, which I was wrong about. This is the first time we see Fee, is this flashback. And Fee talks about the ocean being around and this giant white whale being in the ocean. Um, and interestingly enough, actually, now I'm thinking about it, um, Callus's name is kind of a big giveaway for what he is or what he should be, in that Callus means raven. And the game even points this out. At some point, it says, "Oh, Callus, you mean your name reads Raven in another language?" I think it's Laraku. She brings it up later That's on, right. and yeah, and so yeah, we we could have seen it coming, I suppose, but yeah, come on, like please. Oh, uh, but yeah, um, Fee is Callus's younger brother who dies after Georg is attacked. Um, they escape to the Shrine of Spirits. And again, the game kind of drip feeds us the rest of Callus's backstory. Uh, but the next thing we need to do is figure out how to get rid of Melodia and Malpertio. And we go under the tank clouds to get the Sword of the Heavens, which is the final of these three artifacts. And um, duh, which is the entire nation of the Children of the Earth. Um, the tank clouds we fly over between Inu Inue and Diadem. It's a really cool little thing where they're like, oh, what's under there? It's all poisonous. And it's essentially like, Thousands of years ago, like, the Earth was tainted, and we talked about the ocean being swallowed up by Malpertia, and what it left was this poisonous Earth. So Durr is essentially under that poisonous cloud and is part of the Earth, which is why they're called the Children of the Earth. 
But Dara has got some interesting mechanics to it in terms of like characters and dungeons. And like the three dungeons here are all very different. You've got the Labyrinth of Dur, which is a perspective, like first person almost style dungeon. Like whatever way you enter, you'll face that way essentially. So every time you go through it, your perspective will be different. And that's cool, but it can be a little bit. Oh, yeah. That's not. Yeah. It'll throw you off massively because no one, again. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Just like, especially if you want to like get everything that's in that dungeon, like treasure chest, because I got Mm. out of it and I'm like, oh, wait, I think I forgot a few things. So I went back in and then got more (laughs) lost the second time than I was the first time. (laughs) Yeah. And there's like a monster that you have to give water to, isn't there? And there's a Mm -hmm. couple of, there's like a bracelet person there. There's, there's (gasps) some good Magnus there. I think someone's level seven is, oh, yes. Which, which again, there's a, a bracelet person for, uh, that family tree side quest there and in Wazen, even though people haven't been there for like hundreds <laughs> of years, how did this ki- guy's kids end up getting to these weird places? There's one in the Tower of Zosmer as well, which is a, a upcoming dungeon. No and way, really? There's also another one. Wait, was there? I think, yeah. Yeah, I think so. If I remember right, I didn't go back and get him. I think you have to... Like you, if you climb the tower after you've beaten it the first time, oh, I haven't been at the back. end of the game, there's another one. Yeah, oh there's another gosh. one at the top. Jesus. And it's like, how? At that point, it's open to the rest of the world, sure, but it's like, it's side quest. nah, you you haven't just gone there. You haven't just gone there now. And there's also like a magic book that you have to go inside at one point in the game. And there's also a member of the family tree in there <laughs> as well. And it's like, what? What are you doing? I'd be surprised like, if there was one in Core Hydra. <laughs> oh God, probably. I don't remember actually. Um, but yeah, the Labyrinth of Dura is cool. Oh wait, um, I think I saw one just walking by my window just now. Oh, <laughs> oh God, just like you'll see someone wearing like a blue bracelet, and you'll just be like, "Oh no, I've not got my right cards on me right now." Like, <laughs> can you sign life. this family tree for me? <laughs> Just have this parchment in front of me, like, yeah. Um, but yeah, um, we go to Gemma Village and we meet Key and Mizuti's parents and some of the other children of the earth and Crumley and Camro and I love them all. I love everybody in this village. They're so cool. They're so and yeah. Mizuti's parents in particular, like, you think, Miz- I think at this point, I'd never assumed that Mizuti was a kid. Like, I'd always assume she was, like, this great immortal being because of the way she bigged herself up. And yes, I keep repeatedly doing this as a spoiler. And I did this last episode. Mizuti is a girl, even though she refers to herself as the great Mizuti. It's revealed in Durr um, after a fight with Malpercio um, in a very cool way, which we'll get to in a second. Um, but yeah, like her parents you go in and you meet her parents and it's like this normal family dynamic of her mother like telling her off for escaping because you sensed something was really bad above the clouds and you went up there without telling us or you told us and you just went and then her dad's just like oh, that's fine darling it's okay i'm just like <laughs> well, he, he, yeah he's like she saw something wrong and she went after it i'm proud of her you know? Yeah, I love their dynamic. It's so normal considering, you know, Mizuti is probably the most powerful person in that village, yes. you know, of that oh, yeah. nation of people. So, yeah, like, he respects that. And, like, mm-hmm. the mother's just being the mother, obviously, mm-hmm. but, yeah, it, it's definitely, like, and, and she's, a nice... She definitely is her own character, too. She, You know, she's not just, like, the mm. worry wart. She's, her mother is really cool, too. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the she way that she moments. worries about her is just very natural and it's just a part of her character but yeah yeah yeah. she gets involved in Mizuti's character quest a little later on where she goes to the tower with the rest of the children of the earth and yeah they're all very capable and very interesting individuals like the great camera in his like throne which is essentially him being stuck inside a wall like yeah. <laughs> I was I was like convinced he was part of the wall. So when he like comes out later on, I'm like, oh, you do actually have a body. Yeah. Like I just and a big old that, tomato head. Yeah. Mm. Right. Yeah, I thought that was like the whole like him on the throne. It was like even those legs are kick that are kicking aren't his legs. I'm like, what? Why is that part <laughs> no. of the throne? <laughs> the, like the children of the earth are so interesting, and so much about them is like obscured in this game and like a lot a lot more is revealed in origins like there are references to and actually about the five gods as well um there's a lot of stuff 
that once you play Origins, which is set 20 years before this game, it really sheds some light on some stuff and changes a lot of things very quickly. Like, it's really interesting, and I really recommend people, can, if they get their hands on it, play it, certainly, but... Yeah, like, the Children of the Earth in particular are, like, a nation that are expanded on further because they are they are the people that sealed away, along with the Witches of Wazen, I believe. They sealed away Malpertio, at least in this version, events, like, this version of events kind of thing. But, yeah, we, we, we love them, and they're really cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't love the Garden of Capella, the Garden of Death. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's not as bad as i feared because it's only like what two or three screens but it's just yeah, like, it's like two yeah. screens it's slower to I was surprised actually i was like through. it's already over yeah <laughs> yes yeah. i was thankful it was already over because you just it's, yeah i always you slog through it because it's like mud right and it's like yeah rubber it's, mud rubber mud rubber mud and it's like you yeah imagine? which you can yeah which you can pick up as you go along like you have to or you can use it to rebuild the shop in gamma can't you mm-hmm. so yeah, yeah, it's a cool idea, and I always forget how short it is. It always feels longer, but it's because that yeah, mud. It's, it's also, one terrible. thing, one cool thing is that there are these skeleton enemies in there that look awesome because they have no feet; <laughs> their legs just end in these really disturbingly sharp points. Yeah, they're really similar to the ones in the library. I think. I think they're probably a palette swap. Of oh, them, that's but... right. They are in the library. Yeah. I forgot. See, in my mind, I just had a uh, Fire Emblem Awakening. I, for- I forgot about the library. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yeah that has to oh my god i'd forgotten that entirely <sighs> um but yeah um so you go to the garden of death to get the sword of the heavens but it's been taken so we go to the next village which actually considering like um the village that you go to um after gemma like gemma's got teleports that you can use to go around and get treasure chests but the next village is very normal and very dull but um crumley is the leader of that village and you find out that he's gone to take the sword of the heavens to offer it to a god. What god could that be? <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> he's now he's we have trying to, go to do through damage my least... control. He's trying to be like, my Persio, <sighs> please look past what we did to you and don't kill us when you come back. <laughs> that and let us I up even, into the yeah. sky. I know, right? And it's like, does, is, I'm, I'm sure Melodia is probably aware. Of, well, she says like, so. She the, comes down and duh. she's like, you guys are idiots. <laughs> Thanks for the sword. Yeah, 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 ex- yeah. So she is aware of Durr, isn't she? So it's like, why? Like, maybe if he had not done anything, they might have let you go. Like, they may have forgotten. Who knows? But yeah, you have to climb the Tower of Zosma, which again is like my least favorite thing from the PlayStation Two era of dungeons, where you have to push blocks in directions to solve the puzzle. And Tyler, you came up with a really good point that probably would fix all of my problems with this dungeon. Yes, <laughs> if they had just put in a rotatable camera. It would have made yeah. everything so much better, but alas, it, yeah, they didn't. And yeah, once again, I mean, I'll just offer not... to people who are listening: uh, if when you get to this part, get to where you can dedicate like three hours and just try to do it all in one go, and then it's yes. it, it helps a lot. And yeah. Ma- so like, oh, sorry, I was just also oh. going to just say, make certain you bring a bunch of fire with you. Yeah, um, leave some blank cards because otherwise you're going to be going up and down floors multiple times. Mm. And also, yeah, do it in one go because this is another point in the game where like the timed Magnus really takes effect. Oh, because right. if you leave the weak, if you leave the weak fire in your deck for too long, it will turn into a pebble, and you've got to go and get another one. But and uh, yeah. also, don't get into fights. Uh, those clam enemies <laughs> suck. Um, they suck. They're resistant to everything, and they guard on every hit. And it's like they're just oh. long fights. And I will say one nice thing about this: uh, maybe more than one. I'll say one right now. Two right now. One. Those clam enemies, awful. But I think the other earlier clam enemies you fight in the um, Illusion Garden in Mira um, oh, have yeah. a similar thing. But they have this texture band across. Like where they open across, like going uh, along the edge where they open up, that has like runic text. It looks like little runes that scroll across, and those look great. So they're cool looking. Yeah. Um, and also, so this is a dungeon in which you have to push blocks. That's the entire thing is that you have to push blocks, and if you push a block in a correct place then all of the blocks, because the whole dungeon is made up of similar-looking blocks, 
all the blocks will like light up and ripple out from the point that you connected the right one and it looks really cool. So there's good, there's look some cool. good things about this crappy dungeon that I have said. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a very particular me problem, I must say. Uh-huh. Like even if like <laughs> I'm right there with you. I think it's an all three of us problem, at least. <laughs> okay, so it's an all three of us problem. So I remember saying it once online, I was like, I hate the Tower of Souls because I replayed this like a couple of years ago and then someone was like, Yeah, but it's alright, isn't it? And I'm like, <laughs> No. No. No, I d I just don't like the physics. Like physics based dungeons are really cool when it's magnets and sometimes gravity, like if it's done right. But, like, just pushing blocks into holes is either really boring or especially when everything looks the same. But, hey, I do, and I do like the sound effect as well of when you push the block into the wall. It just makes that really, it like, It is very satisfying, noise. yeah. And then everything lights up and ripples out. And, and it, it, I will say also, it's not even really consistent because the red blocks that are on a surface will drop if you push them off. But then there are some that flow, mm. and if you push those ones, then they'll slide all the way across the room in the air. So it's just, I mean, you can get stuck. You, you can like, if you get stuck, you have to go down the floor, come back up and relight the lamp because you have to light the lamp on the floor before you can do anything, which is where the yeah. fire magnets come in. It's a little bit, uh, uh, it's tedious. Cumbersome. Yeah. Very tedious. It's bad. It's cumbersome and tedious. Yeah. Cause like the climbing, cause you can climb the blocks, you can climb the blocks that you can push as well. And like it's press A to climb, but walk into to push, and it's just like. So you can push a block you yeah. don't mean to. You can climb one you don't mean to. The climbing animation yep. takes about twenty five minutes. Oh um, god, yeah, yep. it's so and slow. And <laughs> as at some point, there's a Qbert level, and in, in the penultimate level, there's a Qbert level where there's like a pyramid of blocks that to climb up. But there are also yeah. frog enemies that jump up and down the extreme edges of it. And if you're in the path, push A quick because. You got to take 8,000 hours to climb down that one block. And then if that frog comes along, you're in a battle and you don't want to get into battles yeah. here. You just don't. Nope, you don't. No. Nope. The, the boss isn't too bad, though. Like, the two elemental dogs are fine. They're kind of cool. Yeah, um, I, 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 yeah not... I got the strategy to get the fire one first. That's one that hits hard. And then you I just thought... take whatever time you need to get the blue one. They were kind of cute and scary at the same time because you're just moving <laughs> these blocks along and they're just kind of watching you. Like, oh yeah, they yeah, they train their head, their eyes on you as you as you're opening up their little kennel and <laughs> down there or whatever. Oh yeah, they're like in the middle of that tower, aren't yeah. they? And as you reveal them, it's like they watch you everywhere you go. It's cool. Is, it's cool. It's really cool. Yeah. How often do you see like bosses in dungeons as you're like solving the dungeon? I think that's pretty cool. But yeah, then you have got another boss fight pretty soon afterwards, and uh, this is the first time you fought Malpercio and. This fight's cool as well. This is where Mizuti gets her moment to shine, I think. Um, it's a very, very, very cool moment yeah. where she gets very angry. I think Hold he attacks So this like is, her. this is, uh, sorry, uh, real quick. This is, yeah. this will be, you're talking about when we're going back to the village after the tower, right? That's right. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, exactly. This is a great moment. Yeah, it's really good. So, like, yeah, she, um, I think Malpercio, if I remember rightly, because I've kind of crammed this in on a couple of days, um, he attacks Key and members of her family, and she loses it, and, like, she has a literal face crack moment where her mask comes off, and she reveals her face before, like, laser beaming him down, and... Yeah, this Incredible. fight is really, really cool. This is also the only time you can actually... Um, I don't think I've explained the camera Magnus too well throughout, but like you can take pictures of enemies and sell them. It's the only way you can get money, actually, yeah. is by selling the cameras. But you can also take pictures of your party members, and they're not worth anything, apart from Mizutis without the mask on. <gasps> and this is the only time you oh, can take Oh, no. no! I didn't I know no that. <laughs> it's not worth tons, mm-hmm. but it's worth more than all the other standard character Magnus and... Yeah, you can take a picture of her because I think you have to use her in this fight, if I remember rightly. Mm-hmm. I think the party is laid out for you because, like, I didn't have Callus in my party in the tower, but uh, Callus was fighting in this one. I think I did have Mizuti though, so yeah, I think they, yeah. I think they set the party for this fight. Yeah, because I think yeah. Gabari was also in my party at this point. Yeah, cool piece of music as well. Like we've talked about the soundtrack on and off, kind of a bunch between the two episodes, but like. This is like the only pure piece of orchestra, I think, used as a fight theme. And it's very, very cool. And it's only used in this fight and in one of the Malpertia fights in the final dungeon. So, yeah, it's just all violins and chanting. And it's very, very cool. Um, 
But yeah, another fake out final boss because guess what? The Sword of the Heavens has been snapped and you can't do anything with it. So, but hey, it's got a nine on it. So it's going in everybody, it's going in someone's deck because I want those rising suns and those like, like sunsets and stuff like that. Did anyone manage to do like the number combos or any of the like really cool high percentage damage things? Yeah, I, I think in- the highest combos I've gotten. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes on purpose, <laughs> then sometimes I would do them and then accidentally throw in a healing item too, but yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I did a few this time. Like, I I always seem to get them with, like, Shella. Shella seems to have... I, I managed to get her deck so well laid out mm-hmm. that, like, I could... I got to a point where I could probably do at least a 1 to 7 every single time I had her up. So that was good. Um, but yeah, like, the Sword of the Heavens, a lot of the... That's all right. Um, uh, the like sort of the heavens, the um, many of her like high attack, like her level five and six spells, and mm-hmm. everybody's levels eight and nine finishes all have a nine on them, and probably also have a one on them as well. So like that's where you want to get them in. And yeah, I I did get a few. I got a few rising suns, which is extremely satisfying. If you get like a one to nine or a nine to one combo once you've got the last class up item. The damage percentage bonus is 255, I think, percent. So you're going from, like, doing 1,600 damage to, like, 10,000 in a hit sometimes. (laughs) It's so cool. I've seen... I've never been able to do it. I've seen somebody take down the final boss in, like, two rounds, and I'm like, I want to be able to be (laughs) this good. Like, please. It's so cool to see. Um. But yeah, um, now this is kind of the last bit before the end of the game. So you find out there's like one last thing you can do. And there's something called the Magnus of Life. And you go back to Corellia and one of the witches says to Callus, which by the way, the witches are not totally brand new to the game as of Shella escaping the fortress. The witches were those three fortune tellers that you met throughout the first part of the mm-hmm. game. So the one in Mira, Diadem and... I can't remember where the third one was. Um, One of them was in the picture book village, but I don't remember where the third person was. Um, But yeah, one of the witches comes to tell you Cottrell and she's like, oh, um, you've got a letter, Callus, and it's from Larakush, who's the doctor who saved you at the beginning of the game. Can I just say, I just just love this serious meeting in the throne room and one of the witches walks in. Well, they, all three of them walk in, but one of them has a bird body. And there's a sound yep, effect. Yeah, she waddles in. Cartoon sound effect of her steps. It's like, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> she's also got a re- she's also got a really bizarre voice as well, like many of the other characters. But hers is in particular. It's just like, hey, Callus, can you do this for me? I'm like, oh my god. They're like, they're like, we got to attack Core Hydra, and she's like. People who solve problems with brute force are a major turnoff to girls. It's like, oh, thanks for that. Info. <laughs> oh, God. Really useful. Oh, yeah. Um, this, yeah. We, we haven't really addressed that, but yeah, this is a, you know, your typical RPG sexism is thrown in throughout the game, like always. <laughs> and that's like one thing in particular. It's like, come on. Like, why do we have to do this bit? Like, just, just, just leave them it's alone. It's like, what, what even is this conversation we're having where you have to what bring, does it up, mean? bring this up? like what does it mean and why is it relevant kind of thing yeah. like uh. but yeah anyway you go to Larikush and actually Larikush is name dropped in the lava caves around the same time that Georg is as well like somebody mentions a doctor named Larikush where you're making the powdered snow and Larikush knows basically everything about Callus. so Pete I know you use the word like android at some point earlier in the episode or before the episode started recording which i thought was a really good way of describing yeah, it. But yeah callus callus is an android <laughs> callus is a a fake not fake human being what's the right synthetic. way to describe artificial. it like synth artificial or synthetic mm-hmm. human being mm-hmm. correct so yeah georg and larry kush were both doctors in the uh, the empire and they used the magnus of life to create callus who was too human i believe gelder blade phrases it he had imperfections then, like humans do. That's right. Basically, the Empire, having one wing. the Empire are the clans from Battletech where they want to make a trueborn <laughs> where they just genetically manufacture people f- 
like to, to be best at whatever they need them to be best at. And they look down on the free births, the people who were born mm-hmm. naturally. I, and then the Empire, they don't literally look down on the free birth, on people who were born naturally. But it's just like the leadership wants to create the perfect person. Yeah. And Georg manages to do it in the second kid, Fee. Um, but they kind of realize how immoral what they're doing is and they don't want to use these kids. I should also say as well, like Giacomo, Amy and Falon were also put through experiments because, you know, there's a reason they're more powerful than most people. It's because they've been put through some kind of experiment and exposure to the Magnus, which makes them really powerful. So, you know, Georg even did this to his own biological kid, which is a bit like woof hmm. oh my god well, maybe yeah he real didn't. it was like real waffen ss energy going on over here in the empire <laughs> science community it's yeah i mean like i always find this stuff really i want to say interesting like i'm always a bit repulsed when they use it in games but i find it so intriguing how different games like use the kind of like it, it's always negative which is a good thing yeah you know, and actually i never thought kind of stuff. i never thought of this but georg and Larikush are like straight up nazi scientists and criminals escaping to argentina and whatever like because they just bail and <laughs> they they yeah. show remorse personally mm-hmm. but oh yeah definitely yeah, they, i actually when i was playing it i like i just made had this realization but when i was playing it i was like oh they're they're good dads they're considering each other the parents of callus and fee and mm. you know they Part of their snap, their like come to Jesus moment of this is wrong is them um, developing, uh, you know, parent like feelings for these kids. Yeah, definitely. So it's not they all do bad, get, but... yeah. No, it's not all bad, and they've certainly, like you said, they've shown remorse in that. And they fake their deaths as well. Actually, like for the longest time, they think they're dead until like Giacomo or Amy gets like a hint that there's a genius technician living in Mira, and they're suddenly like, "Well, there's only one person who fits that name, so obviously they just go and kill him." Like that's the way. Savina is there as well. Savina, interestingly, is one of the people present at Callus's grandfather's death, and we kind of get an answer to what's happened to Fee as well. Like Callus and Fee died after that. But uh, this is, I feel like now the game starts to make like excuses for certain things happening. So like, Fee is the, Fee is the divine child and the phrase is used throughout the game and Giacomo even calls Callus at times the divine child. And technically Callus kind of is the divine child because Fee's life force is inside Callus. So Callus has the power of the Magnus of life, which is the opposite to Malpertio's kind of destructive force and yeah, Callus can use that against him. So, yeah, I I really like Callus's backstory apart from the fact that hey, my dead brother kind of absorbed himself into me or whatever. I'm like, <laughs> mm, all right, fair enough. But yeah, I do like Larikusha's involvement and I think it's cool that it ties into the rest of the like the beginning and end kind of thing like you've suddenly, you know, Larikusha has saved you, but he also knows who you are and is hiding things from the start. So, yeah, I like how the game manages to get away with that. So, Larakush tells you to go to the Celestial Alps uh, to go and get something from Georg. But of course, you have to fight the trio again one last time uh, before you can do that. Two last times. <laughs> two last times, one after the Oof. other, which the, fir- the first fight in particular, you cannot use your spirit powers. So, like, there's an invisible affection meter throughout the game. And the better it is, the more likely you are to, like, trigger these additional elemental spells with callus, like, one for each element. Um, you can't do that in the first fight, which is fine. Okay, so you know, th- I, I... this is cool, like, cinematically, because Giacomo throws these awesome, like, spikes yeah. into the wooden wall in the cabin. And they have little bells on them that ring, and they're supposed to block your spiritual energy. But mechanically, I noticed nothing. So I guess I wasn't... Yeah. aware of some mechanic that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, like the game doesn't explain it to you really. Like this like you know all the you know you get like choices throughout the game as the spirit. Like it doesn't there's like this it, depending on how you answer. Like if you're a jerk to callous or if you're a nice person depending on the situation, if you give the right answer, it makes your affection better and the higher that affection is, the more likely you are to have one of these cards appear at the end of your like Say you've got like a six deck card and you pick card five, one of them might change into this spirit spell. Yeah, that's yeah. happened what? to me before. That is I, cool. I, that's happened. It's cool. And I didn't know what triggered it precisely. I always yeah. thought, oh, maybe I had the right order of cards for some reason, but 
that makes sense, and now I regret some of wow. the sassy choices I made. But on a podcast, well, on a I... podcast where you know ostensibly the three preeminent Baton Kaitos experts are talking about this game, I'm glad we have one at least. <laughs> experts. Yeah, but like, yeah. I mean, I I I didn't know this the first or second time I played through the game. Like, it, the game doesn't explain it to you, and it doesn't multiple things, which. Again, like, but it's similar to the numbers mechanic, Pete. Like, you don't need it to get through. You can get through just sure. fine, but, like, it's another layer. But still, it would be nice for the game to be like, hey, if you're really <laughs> nice to people, you'll get more powerful spells kind of thing. That's like, cool. It's just, yeah. But the fight's kind of cool, and it's way easier than the Goldoba fight. Like, let's put it that way. Even though you have to fight them twice, like, you, your healing item should do, like, 800 to 1500 at this point, and... Yeah, and you're probably way more aware of the mechanics, and you're also not stuck in a dungeon that you can't leave. So you can go back and like give Callus his level six class up. Um, so yeah, uh, Giacomo dies, um, and uh, you get a new winglet for Callus, and Amy and Falon go off on their own. And the game kind of opens up at this point to a bunch of character quests. Um, we probably haven't got time to cover all of them, but is there any that anyone in particular was interested in or enjoyed or? Wanted to talk about? Um, I I don't know about uh, uh, Savina's. I'd like to hear about that. And I also thought that Ludes was cool. Yeah. So Savina's kind of covers a bit more of Operation Sweep to a degree. Um, so you meet Asdar, who was also part of the operation. And you go to a area near Azha where some of the people have come to hibernate or hide away. Because they're being attacked by these demons that have come out of Core Hydra. But all of the people from Azha are the people who were affected because of Operation Sweep. And you go through a desert dungeon, which you have to carry water, Magnus, with you. Because every time you go onto another screen, you have you consume water. So you have to like stockpile as you go through oases and things like that. Um, and then you fight like a demon at the end of it. And you find out that the girl who called Savina a murderer, the demon is her father but he's been tainted by the lava caves, um, the end Magnus in the lava cave. And the implication is that not only were these people being overworked by the empire, but also the people who were like, who died as part of operation sweep were thrown into the lava caves and were resurrected through Malpercio's evil and turned into these demonic creatures. Jeez. So yeah. Um, Whoa. Savina, like doesn't kill the monster immediately um she like protects the girl and she's really and they do kill it eventually but she like re, like asdar and her like talk to the girl and talk her and say like this isn't your dad anymore like the girl can tell it's her father through some i don't know parental familial connections of magic or something and yeah um she kind of accepts that that's not her father and savina puts him out of his misery essentially and it's not forgiveness per se, but it certainly is like, it's like putting, it's like burying it under the rug and like coming to terms with the situation. And it, it, it like, it gives Savina a bit of closure and a bit of happiness, I think, to a degree. Like she can now move on from the tragedy of Operation Sweep and help as hard as she can. But cool. Yeah. It's a pretty cool one. And Leeds is really good as well because it taps into, his insecurities with like his loyalty to the armada or the empire and also like him being a failure in general like Liud has some terrible confidence issues and this dungeon like taps into it like it's it's a it's a revived ghost ship of the goldoba and all of these like apparitions are coming to Liud and they tell him he's worthless and useless and not good enough and the more and more you fight, the more and more they get to him. It doesn't affect him mechanically, but like his dialogue, he becomes like, um, he gets more and more distressed in the party. Like we need to go, we need to leave kind of thing. And yeah, they're worried Leud will go insane, but like, and like a apparition from his grandmother or the nanny, um, kind of pulls him out of it and you have to fight another one of those gnosis monsters. <laughs> um, so, so yeah it is cool. again they, they, they're really good yeah they're really good those two are good in particular like shellers is a bit boring you have to go through like a magic book dungeon which reveals more of like the ice queen's like responsibilities gibari's is a fishing competition with a, a rebelis and anna just like <laughs> anna gets this really cool moment where like the two of them are trying to catch the greater celestial river monster and you get it 
and it's a boss fight um but anna is just watching them and they i think the men call it like this, you'll become a real man of the sky if you catch this fish and anna's just like come on seriously like these men kind of thing i love anna she's to bits good. though she's like a t- she's a typical bar made awesome woman who can just kick butt so yeah and then uh mizutis is doing more tower of zosma oh, <laughs> to get like a she gets to prove herself again like i think the children of the earth are trying to get her a new weapon and they can't do it because she's they're, they're not like the true heirs of it but she turns up and it's like oh yeah you are and then you have to do one of those like card battles again um but yeah, you use the power of the islands to crack through to call Hydra and then you infiltrate the final dungeon, which is essentially lots of different paths that culminate in seven different boss fights or five boss fights and then two fights against Malpercio. Um, so you're like chipping away at the god um, very slowly. And I guess this is a good time to talk about Melodia before we wrap up because there's like one last twist after the two last bosses, which... Malpercio can be a long fight, the last Malpercio. And this is him complete because Melodia essentially becomes part of him. She finds out that when her parents died of an illness, she also died. But Duke Calbron did not want her to pass, so he left her, or like he gave her to the end Magnus underneath the Duke's mansion. And as a result, she was revived, but she was revived tainted by the god Malpercio. So freaking Calbrin. Okay, yeah. like, uh, real quick with Cal- <laughs> Yeah, right. Isn't wasn't one of his ancestors the person? Didn't they do something mm-hmm. bad to the earth? The children of the earth. They, they, stole they, the, uh, uh, they, they the, the earth amulet, sphere. Right? Yeah, they, or, or, yeah, the earth. Yeah, sphere. they stole the earth mm-hmm. sphere. That's right. Yep. They stole the amulet. Okay, so, so yeah. Ch- so yeah, check this out. Calbrin, <laughs> Calbrin, his whole deal is a theme. I think that's very relevant to the real world. That's it's cool that the game covers it because Calbrin, Calbrin, Bren is insufferable. I can't stand that guy. He is a rich person <laughs> in power, and his mm. his power and wealth comes from the subjugation of others. It comes from crimes committed by those in his family. And his just his weakness and his I mean not not to be like that but his his lack of any kind of being able to deal with anything in his life his lack of like it's hard you know you lose a family member it's it's awful but the idea that he would do something like that because he lost a family member yeah first of all he only has the ability to because of the power he has in his kind of status yep. and all that again is has come from his ancestors having subjugated and harmed people and this man just it can't stand the thought of this loss so much that he's going to do something so bad that he knew was bad and the whole time he's sniveling even when he's not when even when you're not talking about that event he's just kind of comes across as useless and like uh he's i don't find him very sympathetic and i think it's cool i think it's for me that is a little sub message in the game and i think it works but yeah calbrin as a character you know treating him as if he were a real person is just insufferable and for he's, me. And he's yeah. kind of like not in the game too much but then his actions and the actions of his family just leave a really really big he's mark. just there to be sad he's just there to be sad <laughs> and make mistakes from his yeah. sadness mm-hmm. basically yeah i mean i don't like melodia either <laughs> i just want to like point that out like, like yeah I'm i think you. melodia is a kind of terrible villain and i really don't like the fake out so like she's just been leading gelda blame on the entire time just because she was accidentally or not accidentally because obviously duke calbra knew that she wouldn't die <laughs> if he put her to the magnus um she's like leading on the world just so she can be free i suppose and like i kind of lose it a little bit towards the end because like what does she want power or freedom and uh, yeah yeah like, that's what i, I was mean, trying to she... figure out it was even it wasn't even that clear to me and i was hoping mm-hmm. we can get some closure on it like was she really the good person all along and just a double agent like a triple agent i'm like double agent no, and I mean... turned on the bad guys I guess she just realized she, she was hiding that she was possessed for so long, but then, well, not possessed, like she'd been tainted, but then she just broke away from it and like gave 
Malpertio the missing part back, I suppose, because obviously, like, Final Malpertio looks different to actual Malpertio, looks cool. who looks a little bit... Yeah, Final Malpertio is really cool, and I really like the final boss, actually. I think it's really cool, except it's not the final boss, because of course it isn't. Because um, <laughs> the game has, like, one last trick up its sleeve, other than Melodia's hair turning teal. And, again, if you've played Origins, you might have some theories about that, so keep them to yourself, everybody, because, mm. yeah... Um, but yeah, so you beat Malpertio and all of the islands descend to the ground and they are propped up by the other five gods, like Al oh, Hair, Che, Lo, Bo, or whatever they're called. And so yeah, every island has one of their own that's propping them up just above the earth and you're no longer floating in the sky. And then you have a big party at Coma Mai and Shella runs off uh, because she's kind of distressed. She's hiding something from everybody else. Callus follows her and Shella reveals... The duty of the Ice Queen is to essentially carry the ocean with them. And all of the little grey thorns, who I have just realised, I haven't mentioned Mimai once through this entire like two and a half to three hour podcast <laughs> that we've been doing. Mimai is the best and the grey thorns, the little bouncy frog things are adorable. So are. yeah, but they're the whale. They're the whale, everybody. So they're very important. And yeah, Shella reveals to Callus like, now everything's back to normal, you need to kill me to release the ocean. And he's reluctant, but you're going to do it until Gelderblame shows up again and is the actual final boss, which <laughs> is never explained in game. I thought, I, I kind of took it as like, like the, the corrupt part of the ocean or something. I don't know. He's like a, he's like an amorphous blob face. Yeah, I'm not sure it's the corrupt part of the ocean, but I know what you mean by that. Like, there's something in the earth or something, or that Gelderblame is, like, the last piece of the, like, tortured Malpertio left to torment something. And, like, every other RPG, in... RPG that has a secret final boss, he's way easier than the second to last boss. Oh, yeah. Boss. Yeah, he's a piece of cake, yeah. Um, but, yeah, um, Shella becomes the ocean. The ocean is restored. There's no longer a lost ocean. It's there. And, and that's cool. Sort of this affected me because I've had kind of a tough week. Mm. And so when Shella mm. disappears and then everything starts raining and, you know, in cinema, rain is always like crying. But in this case, it's like a good cry, <laughs> you know, like how you feel better after a good cry and it's healing the earth and everything. And at this point, I'm mm. like, great. Love it. Even though Shella did um, profess her love to Callus, which is a little bit of i don't know it's fine yeah. i guess maybe but not that great I'm, there's no indication it's like hinted at once isn't it like the bit you know where he wakes up after you like save him and she like blushes yeah they're like, You're blushing. like oh, there's nothing going on <laughs> yeah it's nothing yeah, it would have been it's way like, better if they would have just not had that in there but you know that's that part kind of sucks and but then she's like oh yeah um you know okay the ocean's back she's gone and then, Alana, what happens? <laughs> she's not dead. Oh, she's back. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. It's, like, can no, get it's so inconsequential. <sighs> <sighs> yeah. I mean, I feel like we've been, I feel like I've been a little bit mean on this game throughout the second half, but like, I still love playing it. Like, there's something, and like, I think I always think of the mechanics really fondly, and I think it does some really cool things. There are story parts that like, are cool too. I mean, the children of the earth, and yeah. the fact that Duke Calburn is a total <laughs> thing such and such um that's that's all cool i think that there's something that this game is still saying and i find it i find a lot of interesting mm. parts in it but yeah the main thrust of the, of the plot and its twists can get really a bit much yeah definitely it's like partly too formulaic and then when it tries to do something different it kind of chickens out on it a bit which is like disappointing and yeah i mean i still love this game mm -hmm. i'm always gonna love it and we'll probably play it again in a few years time because i tend to do that with this but yeah there's just some things and i think i haven't replayed origins ever like i've played it once Same. it never came out over here actually um so i have an imported copy and a action replay disc ready to go so yes I'm always ready to replay that one. Yeah, um, definitely. I, I also Tyler, loved did it. You get... Yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. We're all talking at the same time. I just want to say that, like, yeah, I've also, like, popped on some stuff. But this game is awesome. So good. Like, play it if you can. That's all I got to say. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. It's hard to get hold of. But certainly, if you can get hold of it and the sequel or prequel, um, I really recommend it. Because it's got some really interesting ideas going on. And, like, 
Yeah, so, you know, the, the, it's definitely typical of its time, but it does so many things differently. And I don't think, like, even the sequel's different enough that they're not, like, hugely similar gameplay-wise. Mm-hmm. Like, they both use a card system, but it's so different in Origins that it's a, it's a lot it's a, quicker It's a lot well. more streamlined, and I really like that about it. Mm. But, yeah. But, yeah, I think we've all had a, It's been a really interesting game to revisit. Like, as a first, like... This is the, I, I say I replayed it two years ago and always have a really good time with it because I just enjoy it, it's one of those numbers games like when I play a beat em up or an action RPG if I do like a lot of damage in one hit I'm really happy or I do high combos mm. and this is the same like if I do a nine card mm-hmm. combo and do like 10,000 damage I'm like that makes the rest of the game worth mm-hmm. it so yeah it does some really cool things and it's really unique and I wish it was more available and I hope one day Monolith Soft get to revisit and do a sequel or port them to Switch or something like that because I think people would get some enjoyment out of it. Like definitely. It's interesting. But yeah, um, unless anybody else has got anything else to say, I think we're all done with Barton Kytos, which I look forward to playing Origins. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, we're going to try and petition for Origins to be on the podcast. Uh, Please, please, please. If it's like a year from now, I wouldn't mind that. I'm just, <laughs> I think I need a button Kaito's break. <laughs> I kind of filled my life with yeah. this game a little bit, but, um, but yeah, I, I'm intrigued by Origins. And if you say that it's a little bit more breezy, hey, that works for me. Mm. Yeah, and a really good cast of characters as well. I'd say that's and free. it has good voice acting. Ooh, I gotta yes. see that. Good voice acting, consistently good music. Like it's it's generally better and more polished, but it just did not get a wide reach because Barton Kaitos didn't sell too great. And like I say, it, Origins didn't even come out in Europe. Like we didn't get it full stop. So yeah, I was importing that baby and playing it through, of course. But yeah, hopefully we'll see an Origins episode at some point in the future. So yeah, um, if you want to hear about that, let us know. Uh, but before I spiel on about all of the ways you can contact us, we should tell you what's coming up on Retro Encounter. So in February, the next game we'll be playing is Radiant Historia. So more interesting gameplay mechanics, more pretty visuals, more good music. And yeah, like this is kind of one of the last games that came out on the DS. It really made a splash. And yeah, I'm going to be playing it for the first time. So I'm really, really excited to visit that. It's been a blind spot on like modern RPG history. Like a yeah, I, I, I'm pretty up on my more modern RPGs, um, but like this is one of the blind spots because it didn't come out on the DS in Europe. We only got the 3DS version, so yeah, here we go. I've got a DS copy though, so I'm going to be playing through the original version of that. That's going to be great. Well, you can take um, comfort in next... knowing that Europe got the best version of Bangai O for the Dreamcast, so there's at least that. Excellent. I feel like I should know what that is, knowing that I love the Dreamcast so much. I'm going to look that up straight oh, away. Oh, it's great. And I can't Terra- oh, discover we that one. We got Terra Enigma. We will. Yeah. Uh, oh, and got we got Terra Enigma as yes. well, so I'll take that. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Huh. So, yeah, silver linings, I guess. Uh, but yeah, um, more immediately, next episode will be a Yakuza Like a Dragon spoiler cast. Uh, I'm going to be listening to that. I haven't played the game, so I'm going to spoil the <laughs> hell out of it, but I want to listen to my favorite people talk about Yakuza Like a Dragon. So, yeah, if you've played the game or are not, like, are you interested in spoilers or you're interested in the game and not worried about spoiling it, then please come back next week. Everything's back to normal in February. No more me on the hosting seat or anything Aww. like that, so it's all good. Um, <laughs> I've had a really good Cut time, actually. Out. It's been Who's a lot of fun. Cut hey, I'm... <sighs> um, but yeah, um, other than Yakuza Like a Dragon, we're also going to be doing an episode on Final Fantasy fourteen A Realm Reborn. It's going to be part one of an ongoing series of episodes that we're going to be doing on the MMORPG. We'll know in a early February what the new expansion will be like, so we're going to be celebrating because... Final Fantasy XIV is great, everybody. Uh, if you're not playing it, I can't tell you to play it because I haven't played it for four years, so I'm not the person. Uh, but if you want to be convinced, go listen to Mike Solosi talk to one Final Fantasy XIV veteran and someone who's relatively new to that game. So it's going to be a good episode to listen to. Uh, as for March's game journal, I'm still going to keep that one under wraps. Uh, Mike Solosi will probably tell you about that next week. Uh, but it's a very, very, very pretty game. We're doing pretty games this year, apparently. So... Yeah, it's going to be a good one. I'm really looking forward to that one. I won't be on those episodes, but it is a another personal favorite of mine from 
the late 2000s. So I think you'll enjoy it. Um, but if you want to reach out to us, either to tell us to play Barton Kytos Origins, which please do, or any other suggestions, questions, comments, uh, you can email us at retro at rpgfan.com. You can also comment on our posts or on our forums. You can come and visit us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We've got our own Discord server as well, which you can join. We've got a YouTube channel where we post reviews and recaps and summaries of the beginnings of games and long plays and things like that. So come check us out. We also have a Twitch channel, which we stream on every day, pretty much. So Scott does such fabulous work over there, which has been... It's really cool to watch him play through the Cold Steel series, which is... Yeah, he, we're, we're big Falcom fans and RPG fan, and there's a lot of Falcom content on Twitch. So come check us out if you're into that, or just want to see what cool retro games we're playing. Uh, we've also got three other fine podcasts. We've got Random Encounter, about random topics and events. We've got Rhythm Encounter, which is about music for RPGs and adventure games. And we've also got Phoenix Edge, which is our partner podcast, which covers current events and news. Uh, if you're interested in, or if you enjoy any of the podcasts, or if you listen to them, please rate and review us and give us feedback on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, whatever podcast listening app you use. Give us everything give us all the five stars you can give us and all the feedback we love it but to close us out where can we hear from the other panelists so starting with you pete uh on twitter i'm pete barbero one and uh if you want to uh see me play you know right now it's about 50 50 between genshin impact and like historical combat flight simulators <laughs> you can uh but i i play a bunch of stuff uh you can follow me on uh, twitch at rg halfpenny all right and you do you do archive your streams i did check so don't worry you've clicked all the right buttons i've made sure of i've this. graduated from grandpa <laughs> status yes <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no you should check them out they're really cool and you've got a breadth there like genshin impact is the big hotness right now. Oh so, man, Genshin Impact is yeah. so good, you guys. It's also not. It's also horrible. <laughs> it's so good though. <laughs> <laughs> you can hear you can hear him talk about that a little bit on Random coming check up in random. a few weeks' time. So, yeah, definitely check out Random Encounter. Uh, but yeah, Tyler, where can we find uh, you? Yeah, I am at Cosmos Chaos on Twitter, and that's Cosmos with a K. Um, and then I also have a podcast uh, that's at Zenochat Podcast. If you ever want to talk about Zeno related stuff which I do have a, a quick question I want to ask you guys yes or no did you did you mm. guys unlock the rare action figure card in Botan Kaitos no I, I didn't did. it's <laughs> it's a constellation reward. it's Cosmos from Zeno Saga <laughs> I unfortunately which I didn't know until this oh time. my god <laughs> 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 it's because it's so shrunk down like it doesn't look like yeah. her at all no, it's like only when I looked properly I was like oh it's Cosmos right, yeah. okay fine but yeah it's just a cool cool like, little reference cool like little reference lot. does nothing but it's cool <laughs> it does Yeah, you can sell it but why would exactly. you do that that would make Tyler very unhappy I would be unhappy. very upset it would make Tyler very make Tyler very unhappy and we'd have to end this podcast unhappy but uh if you want to come and find me on social media you can find me on twitter i am at alana hagues on there i'm also as part of the rpg fan discord i tend to hang out on the podcast channel so if you just at alana me then you'll probably call flammy down without using the drum you know or if you want to email me direct you can i am alana h at rpgfan.com so if you want to be more professional about it then Come give me a little wave in my emails because they don't get too busy nowadays. But yeah, that kind of brings us to a close on Barton Kytos. I'm a little sad because I never get to talk about this game. And like three hours almost of podcasting about it has been really, really cool. And I'm really glad that, Pete, you've enjoyed it because you're a new person to the game. And Tyler, I'm glad you got to re-experience it for, for the first time in a while. So yeah, it's been a blast. This and hopefully great. I really can enjoyed it. In a while. Yeah, I really enjoyed it it's been fun revisiting it yeah so hopefully we'll be back to talk about origins at some point in the future but for now thank you for listening everyone thank you good night and good luck <laughs>